So today I'm going to show you guys how to use a schematic off of a unit to find key test points with your multimeter on the electrical circuitry in the unit and we're also going to show you how the schematic can tell you what kind of voltage readings you should expect to see at those particular testing points. So we're going to start doing that on this condensing unit today. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this schematic on the screen for you guys so you can see it. I'm also going to put a link in the description box down below that you can download the manual for this particular unit and the schematic we're working off today would be on page 23 in that manual. So to begin with the schematic, we notice we have dark, bold, black lines, thin black lines, and then we have bold black lines with perforations in them. And what that basically is, those black lines with perforations with them, uh, those are optional pieces of equipment. So those are things that may or may not actually be in this uh, unit. Uh, these are optional things that may come from the factory sometimes. So when we look at this particular schematic here, we see those uh, dark perforated lines going to a start capacitor or start relay. This particular unit does not have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that off the schematic so you guys can clean it up for you and you can see it a little better. Um, we also have what's called a start assist right here. Um, that would be like a hard start kit. We don't have one of those on this either, so I'm going to take that off the schematic. Um, and this is just so you guys can see a little more clearer, less lines, a little less confusion. But if those devices were included in this, what I'm going to show you today would still be applied to those. So this is just for convenience, um, make things a little bit more simpler for you guys. So as always with these kind of schematics, I always begin with the power coming into the unit. And let me bring you guys in so we can get a close up of that wiring. So when we look at our schematic, we see what is called a single pole contactor. Now what that means is that between L2 and T2, we have this plunger here. So that is the coil that gets pulled in on the 24 volt signal from our thermostat. But on this side of the contactor, we do not have a switch. If we look at our schematic, we can see there's a straight bold line going all the way through. It's so basically what that means. If we have line voltage coming in on this L1 terminal here, we should have it continuing on through the contactor. So we should read voltage at T1 up here on the top side of the contactor, even if the unit is off. So I want to show you guys something that's really important to understand when it comes to reading voltages and what a multimeter actually does. So if I were to take my probe and I were to test for voltage off of L1 to ground, you see I'm reading about 124 volts. Now, because I do not have any kind of a switch in here, it's powered straight through. I'm also going to read 120 on T1 to ground. You can see I'm reading 124 there as well. Now, here's the thing. If I were to go from L1 to T1, I'm reading zero volts. Now, why am I reading zero volts? Even though I just proved to you there's 120 volts there. And this is where sine waves come in. When you have 120 volts coming in on a line, it generates a sine wave. So you have peaks and you have troughs. When electricity is at that peak, it's at plus 120. When it is at that trough, it is negative 120. So if I were to take two different line voltages coming in that are out of 180 degrees out of sync of one another, what I'm doing between L1 and L2 is I'm reading one line that's at plus 120 and the other line that's negative 120 and the difference between plus 120 and negative 120 is 240 and that's why I'm reading 240 volts between L1 and L2. But between L1 and T1, the reason why I'm reading zero volts there, even though I know there is power there, is because I'm basically, imagine putting my probes on the same exact point on a sine wave. So if I'm reading plus 120 on L1, I'm also going to be reading plus 120 on T1, and the difference between plus 120 and plus 120 is zero. Or vice versa, I'm reading negative 120 on both of them, which is also going to be a difference of zero. So that's why my meter is reading zero, even though I actually have 120 volts there. So it's, under, it's really important to understand how a multimeter actually works and what kind of readings you get based on where you're actually locating your probes. Now can tell from our schematic, we're always gonna have power at this T1 terminal, whether the unit is running or not. It's always gonna be there. Now, if you look at uh, the lower left corner of this schematic here, you could see where it says alternate double pole contactor. So basically what that is, 
is this right here. This is a two pole contactor. So we have two plungers here, one on each side. And what that does is it cuts off L1 and L2 from T1 and T2. So on this particular contactor, both of those plungers have to pull in in order for 120 to get up top of T1 and T2. So on this particular contactor, because we do not have a switch, it's, it's hardwired straight through. I'm always going to have power on any wires that are connected to that T1 terminal. Now we can see one of these black wires here, if we trace it off our schematic, that it goes straight to the common winding on our compressor. Right? It goes through an internal overload switch which is inside the compressor itself and, and lands on that common winding. So what I'm going to do right now is I have my power off on this system, the disconnect is off, and I'm going to take this pink and yellow wire that activates the contactor and I'm going to pull that off the terminal. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm going to show you guys, ooh, sorry. So I now have that 24 volt signal on a call for cooling disconnected from the contactor before I show you guys this because what I'm doing now is I have this fan motor off the top of the unit. I'm going to pull the black wire off the compressor inside and I'm going to show you guys that I should be reading 120 volts going right up into the compressor even though this unit is off. And the reason why I'm pulling this wire off is because I have to put my disconnect back on to show you that voltage and I don't want somebody inside trying to turn this unit on while I have it apart and my hands are in there. Um, if this contactor were to pull in with the power on it, the fan motor on top would start spinning and I could lose limbs doing that. So this is kind of a safety precaution to save my own ass. So here's our connector. We can see the black wire coming in. This is the common terminal right on the top here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put one probe into that common terminal. All right, I'm going to take the other one, I'm going to put it on the copper, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the breaker back on, and we should be reading voltage there. And you can see I'm reading 122, 125, 126. So as you can see, there's power going all the way up to the compressor common winding, even though the unit is completely off. We have 120 going from L1 to T1 at all times. That 120 is going down to the common terminal on the compressor at all times. Now, if we look at our schematic and we continue following that black line as it goes into the compressor, comes in our, to our internal overload switch. That's a thermal overload switch that should always be closed unless the compressor is overheating. Now as we follow that we could see it goes through our main and auxiliary windings in our compressor. That's our start and run windings. And if we continue to follow that red wire coming all the way back to T2 on the contactor. So we actually have voltage going all the way through that whole thing, all the way back to T2, because there's no switches in there other than the internal overload switch itself. So if that internal overload switch is closed, according to this schematic, I should be reading 120 volts at T2 on this contactor, even though my plunger is open. So I'm gonna put one probe on T2, the other on a ground. And as you can see, I definitely have 124 volts there. So I have 120 here, I have 120 here, I have 120 here, I have 120 here, but the unit's not running. Um, and the reason why is because these compressors and condenser fan motors do 240 volt motors. This open plunger here opens one of those 120 volt lines. So we, even though we have voltage which seemingly everywhere, we do not have a complete circuit between this contactor. Now going back to my lesson earlier about sine waves, if I were to take one probe and put it on T1 and the other probe and put it on T2, look at what I'm seeing there, zero volts. And the reason why is because when this plunger is open, what I'm basically reading is the same line voltage and the same sine wave, and I'm putting my probes on the same sine wave. So I got no potential difference there. Once this plunger goes closed, I will then actually read 240 volts here between these same two points. Because when this plunger closes, I am now completing a circuit for a completely different line voltage and these two different uh, 
line sine wave readings that I'm taking here right now with the plunger open are going to change. See, like right now between T1 and T2, I'm reading zero volts because they're both either reading plus 120 or minus 120. Whereas once this contactor closes, this becomes a completely different line voltage with different sine waves. And then I will be reading plus 120 and negative 120 or vice versa, which will give me a difference of 240. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you guys exactly what I mean. If I put my terminals, uh, my probes on terminals T1 and T2, as you can see, I'm reading zero volts. Now I have my compressor plugged back in, all right? Now what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna push that plunger in and as soon as I do, I should be reading 240 volts there. Now, just so you guys know, on a side note, I disconnected this brown wire from my dual capacitor and this basically feeds power to my condenser fan motor because I don't want that turning on when I push the contactor in because I still have that pulled off. So let's go ahead and push it in. And you can see I'm reading 247. So there you go. Okay, so according to our schematic and what we've seen so far, we have 120 volts coming in on line one, going directly to T1. That T1 is going to a black wire, brings us to the common terminal on our compressor, which we've proven has 120 volts there. Uh, goes through our internal overload, goes through our main winding, comes back on a red wire to the T2 terminal, and we've proven we have 120 volts there as well. So we have other wires connected to the T2 here. So we do have another red wire, and as we trace that out, we see it brings us to the common terminal on our dual capacitor. So according to everything we've seen so far, we should be reading 120 volts at that red wire on the common terminal of our capacitor. So let's see if we do. So I'm gonna put one probe on my common terminal, another to ground, and we are reading 124 there as well. So you see, we got power going to a lot of places in this unit, even though the contactor's not pulled in, the thing's not running at all. So what else is connected to that common? We see a purple wire there connected to that same common terminal on our dual capacitor. And when we look at our schematic and we trace that out, that purple wire is going right to the main winding on our condenser fan motor. And if we continue tracing that, goes into our internal overload on the fan motor, comes to a black wire, which brings us all the way back to T1 again. So you could see we have pretty much power everywhere, even though our unit's not even running. So basically this just goes to show you whenever you're dealing with a single pole contactor like we are today, you're gonna find power pretty much everywhere. Now, if we had the double bolt contactor like this one, we wouldn't be getting all these readings everywhere. Now, I didn't dive deep into diagnostics today. I'm going to make a separate video that focuses exclusively on that. But what I showed you today is the essential in learning how to properly diagnose systems. Because even if I showed you how to do a diagnostic test on a, a contactor, for example, on this unit, um, you may come across a different situation on another unit. And if you don't understand the principles I showed you today on how to look at a schematic, how to expect what readings you should be getting and where, um, you may find yourself in a slightly different situation with a very slightly different wiring arrangement and not understand the readings you're getting even though you know how to perform a diagnostic test on a piece of equipment or a, a particular part. Um, there's very different things going on with different units and if you don't understand these fundamentals I showed you today it's easy to get fooled by your own readings. So I hope that helped you guys out. Um, stay tuned for the next one.